Hey, Flooring Pros, I'm Jerry Levinson, and this is the Flooring Business Podcast, where each week we talk to expert flooring dealers, suppliers, marketing experts, software experts, and anyone I believe who will help you in your flooring business. Now, my mission is to give you good information that will help you reach your goals. So if you're just starting your business out, or you're trying to reach $5 million in sales, or you're getting ready to sell the business, you're going to find useful information that will help you reach your goals and profit now in the flooring industry. The Flooring Business Podcast is sponsored by Market Theory, and right now you can take advantage of the 3090 guarantee, where we guarantee you'll get at least 30 in-home estimates, not just leads, in just 90 days. And to learn more about that, contact me at jerry at profitnowwithjerry.com. All right, so now this week I have back re reoccurring guests. We had a good conversation last time. Uh, Matt Garcia with Craftsman Hardwood Flooring. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Hello, doing great, Jerry. Good to be on again. Busier than ever? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're cranking away. <laughs> Not really slowing down. Tell us a little bit about, uh, remind us, what is your business? Do you guys just do new hardwood? Do you do refinishing? Give us a little bit of, of your background and the scope of your yeah. business. Yeah, we're at Craftsman Hardwood Flooring. So we specialize in wood flooring. Uh, we refinish them. You know, our, our, the idea is that we can do anything hardwood floor related that you need. Uh, we do a little bit of a uh, vinyl plank because uh, uh, we do have a lot of customers that that's a good fit for them. And it's kind of right up the same alley. If you could do uh, wood floors, you know, why not uh, do that as well? So um, it, that's also what we what we offer. Do you do any tile work? Uh, no, no, no tile. Uh, and then carpet too. Do you? Yeah. Carpet and tile, we sell us, uh, we do uh, kerosene area rugs. Oh, wow. Okay, nice. Had a conversation uh, recently about kerosene too. Um, okay. So that was interesting. Um, all right. So the conversation I had the other day with uh, the Floor Covering Education Foundation, we were talking about getting installers. That's not what we're talking about here, but I wanted to go over that with you because you've been on both sides of, of the fence. And addressing the problem, what is the real reason that we're having trouble attracting installers or attracting anybody to become an installer to the flooring industry? And a lot of us guess at this problem and have said, you know, well, we don't pay enough or the work's too hard or they can get a job elsewhere much cheaper. And what I learned from that interview was we're not even on the menu, <laughs> you know? So uh, imagine a guidance counselor or anybody talking to kids about what you want to do with your future, you know? What, so what if you're not going to go to college and get a higher degree? So there's a lot of trades now that'll hire you. There's electricians and, and plumbers, there's drywall framing, um, all these different options. Floor covering installation is not even mentioned. So uh, Jim Aaron was uh, interviewing a class of high school students and they were talking about what do you want to do for your career? And he says, um, have any of you considered doing floor ins flooring installation? And the kid said, that's a thing. <laughs> they, they weren't even aware that this industry existed, which sounds crazy to us, I know. But if you think about it, why would they be? I mean, what do they have to do with flooring installation other than walking on flooring their whole lives? <laughs> yeah. Why would they give that a second thought? Or can, it's, it's always somebody else does that. Yes, yeah, so there are people that do that. Yeah, it's like the hidden trade. And it's not a horrible trade. It's not a horrible industry. It's very good. It's very lucrative. And there's a way to sell it to the kids to make it appealing. Oh, yeah. Get started and, and not only get started, but they can get started making money right away. Yeah, I, um, I'm mentoring um, an, uh, an apprentice uh, um, right now in our company. And, uh, he's, you know, he's on the cruise, but I, I pay special attention to him. He's 18 years old. And, um, he, he started off volunteering for a church and, uh, before, when he was still in high school and he just, he's just one of those kids that you, you, you know, they have it, 
Um, yeah. Great head on her shoulders, great ethic and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I told him, hey, you have a job, you know, if you, if you, um, you know, decide that, that uh, you, you don't want to take the, the college route, uh, I will make sure that you're making good money at the same time that you'd be graduating college and you won't have any debt. And he loves working with his hands. You know, that's what he wanted to do. And I mean, he's like kind of my case study right now because I'm going, OK, I'm going to you know, take this young guy. I'm going to really, you know, I'm going to pour into him. I'm going to mentor him. I'm going to, you know, I just want to see how well he can do and compare that, you know, to somebody that, you know, might be going to a university and graduate with college debt. And, you know, he'd be doing something that he loves. I'm trying to make sure that, that the, the path that he's taken is something that he loves. And I, it, it is a shame that that is not more well known that you can take that path uh, in foreign. Well, not only is it a shame, but to me, it's exciting because yeah, that's a problem that can be solved. And, yeah. you know, going through the Floor Covering Education Foundation, um, who is leading the charge on it, and I'll, there's just scores of people that have had great ideas, but it's kind of hard to wrap your arms around it and really make it happen. Well, these guys are full time making it happen. And, and some people said, well, it's up to us as the installers. No, I'm sorry. Installers aren't going to lead the charge on it. They can have an effect for their business or in their backyard. But as an industry, we need a company that's dedicated to this. And where they're starting is by reaching out to all the major cities and finding the, the trade schools or whatever, getting them to offer uh, floor covering installation, you know, so, um, we talked about this before they're in Georgia, so it's not practical to send everybody to Georgia for 10 weeks, uh, yeah. and learn, you know, unpaid, you know, and some employers will go ahead and pay them to learn and get that education. And then when they come out too, some people are saying, well, they, they can't install floors. Well, no, but that gets them on the path that, yeah. that puts them in the funnel of installers. And they said we're losing 4,000 to 6,000 installers a year. And the average age is 56 right now. It's yep. crazy. So oh, yeah. yep. I'm excited about it because I think, I think that's something that everybody can work towards is educating people about it. And when they get some of their processes down where, you know, if you find kids or somebody interested, where do we send them? We need to know the link or the place to send them. So they can yep. go in the next step, see if there's something in their area. If not, are there scholarships? And the donations we're asking for now is to help out with the scholarships. So mm -hmm. Mohawk Shaw, all the big companies, they're going to get Home Depot, Lowe's to pitch in there. Uh, and now they're asking all the flooring dealers too to pitch in just a little bit, $100 a month and pitch in to help solve the problem, which I think we can. I'm, I'm encouraged about it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's awesome that they're doing that. I mean, I, I totally support it. I mean, it, it, I, I think it's, I, I really do care about this industry as a whole. You know, I would love to see impact industry-wide. Um, I've already seen, I mean, since I started, I'm, I've already seen, you know, I've, I've been in it for, you know, over 20 years uh, from the insult to the retail side. And, and I see change happening. I, I feel like I want it to happen quicker, but I, I do see the ball rolling um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I have guys in my own town that are reaching out to me saying, hey, uh, I just got certified. I just realized that you are, uh, you know, I really want to do, you know, better work. And, you know, I'm not in a big area and I, I'm just going, oh, wow, that's that's really neat that I have people that I didn't even know existed in my own area that yeah. are getting excited about that. I, I honestly had never seen that level kind of a grassroots um, response to it. And I know it's small, but guys are getting excited about it. And, you know, uh, retailer, you know, you know, there's a lot of people that really care about this industry. And to me, it's like, you know, I, I like to be, you know, I like to give to others. And, you know, to me, it's not all about, you know, uh, of course, I want to make a great living and all that, too, but I want to make an impact for the next generation. Like, uh, I legitimately want to see, you know, flooring dealers, you know, succeeding. I want to see installers succeeding. I want to see these young people have a great, you know, the American dream. You know yeah. what I mean? Be, get into a good, solid trade, work hard, 
and uh, and benefit greatly from it. You know, I mean, I, I I'm passionate about that. I I, I love every- industry. It's just full of opportunities. There's everywhere yeah. you look. There's opportunity everywhere for our, uh, anybody that wants to take it up. Um. Do you remember what got us on the conversation we're going to have? We wanted to discuss about doing site inspections. And first of all, is it necessary? And yeah. if you do do that, how do you go about it? And, and just a realistic conversation, because we know there are companies that never have a site inspection done. I can tell you, we never had a site inspection done, but the majority of what we sold was carpet. So... Yeah. Walk us through, what do you guys do when it comes to uh, you sold the job mm-hmm. or do you do it before you sold the job uh, in preparing your estimate or do you do it after the job is sold? We, we do it before the job sold. Um, you know, we, we are more of a niche company and we're probably, I mean, I, we're pro- there's probably more failures in wood flooring than there is any other type of, of flooring. I mean, I know tile, you know, showers stuff can get pretty problematic as well, but um, you know, if your site evaluation is not done with wood flooring and, and, and you don't get that on, you know, immediately addressed, uh, you, you're, you're going to have problems eventually. Um, you sell enough of it. You're going to have complete failures. Do you think your competition does site inspections? Um, to some degree, um, I subbed for my competition before I started my real, uh, my, uh, my, my own uh, retail store. And so I, I pretty much know how they operate. And it, it, it's, it's depending on who, who the uh, salesperson was, is going to be the, the side evaluator. And it's a bit hit, hit and miss. I mean, sometimes they would catch it, sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, more times than not, they were missing a lot of things. Um, you know, it, um, it, and I've gotten lots of calls to fix things too as well. So I'm kind of in a unique situation since um, we are considered the experts in wood flooring. So even a lot of the, the other retail stores, I have a good relationship with them and they will actually ask me, hey, I'm in deep doo doo here we have a a major issue, you know, can you help, help this to go away, like to resolve it. And so I, I kind of get to see a little bit of all of that. Has it helped you close sales? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, definitely. Um, Do you know what your closing rate is? Would you? Yeah, it's, um, we're, we're in the 60, 60 to 70% range right now. We've, we we were like near a hundred and, I was just, we, we had to raise our prices. I mean, that, you know, you, you know how that, that game goes. So Yeah, I mean, 60 to 7% doing what you're doing is really, really high. So typically yeah. on higher end products like that, it, your closing rate, I think the typical closing rate is around 50%. But once you start getting into more expensive products, that goes down. So to be at 60 or 70% is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of that is because... I'm, I'm very passionate about what we do. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm with installers and things like that. And the clients, they, they're kind of already pre-sold. We have, we have such a high uh, referral rate um, that it, a, a lot of our customers are, are ready to buy. So, um, it, and we're not in a large community as well. So I, I think that we are going to have a higher, you know, just kind of the, the type of business I wouldn't compare us to a, you know, uh, an all around retail flooring store in that, in that regard. But uh, we, we, I have noticed as we have increased prices, we have, you know, dropped a bit um, on our close rate. And um, I honestly, we're, we're, we need to raise prices more, um, yeah. you know. Well, consist- and again, doing the side evaluation should put you way ahead of the competition. You know, I I think uh, naming that site evaluation, adding some guarantees to the workmanship and and, um, the site evaluation might even be something that you could sell. And uh, because uh, I would, if I did that same process, if I had any type of site evaluation process, I would do that after the job is sold. I would let my salesperson go in sell the job. Once I know I have the job and I'm getting paid, then I would send my professional, you know, because whoever's doing that site evaluation, it has a skill level that's beyond just the ordinary salesperson, right? 
So they might be the owner, a former installer, but they do have a level of skill that should be paid for. So I would, I would add that in after the job was sold. Um, what's, explain the process for us. Uh, what is your process? Customer calls you up, they'd like an estimate for hardwood flooring. What happens next? Yeah, we, we try to pre-qualify them. Um, we ballpark them, some ranges of pricing and things like that. Um, we, uh, we do charge for estimates depending on the situation. Okay. Uh, and so if, if we feel like it's gonna be, if we have to travel very far or, or we know it's gonna be technical, we, we, um, we, we, we basically throw out a number for them uh, before we even get started with it. Um, and um, they, they pretty much always are okay with it. And so that, that may be standard procedure now just, just to charge for it immediately. We, we do like to try to get them into the showroom to at least kind of like get some ideas about the flooring and, um, um, and some ideas so that when I go do the site evaluation, um, it's not blind. Um, we, I'm, I'm almost locking in the sale at the site evaluation. So right. we don't have a contract per se, but I have an idea of what they want, what they're looking for. Um, you know, I, I love the sales end of it too. So I'm, I'm, I'm really more than a side evaluator. And so I basically our, our, um, our salesperson is going to be um, choosing a lot of design and style for them. And then um, they'll a lot of times have the samples at their home already. So I come in as a side evaluator and, um, you know, talk to them more about the design um, and some of the options. I, I try not to step on the toes of the salesperson per se, but um, I give them feedback based off of my site evaluation. So if they're looking at a product that may be um, uh, one of the products would be more advantageous depending on the site, then I'll steer them in that direction. Or sometimes uh, we have to do a 180 and the products that they're interested in just won't work for their site. Um, or, you know, maybe there's a product that takes more prep um, to do, you know, there, there, there's just different situations that my side of it, you know, hard surface is different than you know, if it were carpet, it honestly would not be as much of an issue because carpet can, doesn't have the prep standards per se. I mean, right. you, you can get away with a lot more with that, and especially with us, where we're trying to sell, you know, higher end products and jobs. and um, um, the clients really do appreciate when I bring in the technical expertise and, you know, some of them want to know more or less, some of them, I just basically say, Hey, you know, X, Y, and Z, this is how it is. And other, other clients, they want to know the why, the how, and all that kind of stuff. And I can kind of meet them where they're at, but it really does seal the deal. Um, the one downside is, you know, um, it's difficult to scale our type of business. It's, right. you know, um, that is, and again, I, I would make the suggestion that the way that you can scale it from where you're at now is by simply allowing the salesperson to sell the job and then going out and doing the site uh, evaluation when the job is sold. And as a salesperson, I would love to be able to tell a client, you know, one of the things I love about working with this company is Matt, the owner, he comes out and does a site evaluation and it really prevents us from surprises helps your job go smoother and you know it, it allows us to offer the owner's promise guarantee because you yeah. know matt himself he was an installer he's looking at this i mean to me if you're a salesperson that makes it so much easier and yeah but if this person's not in the ballpark and they probably weren't a customer to begin with and and they don't go with you guys well it doesn't make sense to spend your time visiting somebody that may or may not go with you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. As you know, right now it's not so much of a thing, but you know, I don't want to be a massive company, but I want to, I do want to do more volume than we're doing right now. And so that, you know, that is a consideration, you know, where I'm, you know, I could really get down and, you know, I, I love that. I, I actually love that the job that I've created for myself because I, I kind of get to do what I love to do, which is, you know, uh, do the technical side, but really, you know, sell the passion that we have for what we do to the customers. Cause I mean, they, it is so neat just seeing their face light up and, you know, I'll suggest, Hey, uh, you know, we can do the floor that you like in a herringbone pattern 
in your entryway and we'll, you know, make a border around it and we can do this and this and, yeah. you know, oh man, they just start. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. It's like a piece of art now. And, and, you know, and then yeah. we can get kind of the frosting on top of the cake, you know, with the job and, and stuff like that. And so uh, I would really love to figure out how to really, uh, you know, to scale that up as, you know, so that we can still offer that, you know, as we, as we grow our sales and, and stuff like that. So yeah. I, I did the same thing. I would love to do it. I did the same thing in the window covering business where um, I had my salespeople. I, I would tell them, don't, don't get good measurements. Just sell the job. So yeah. go in there and this is 48 by 48, you know, and this is 48 by 60. And, you know, when you go with the order, Jerry comes out and does a check measure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was an installer too. So I could tell all the stuff and not nearly as, complicated it is flooring but it still was a great experience for the customer but i never went out on a job that wasn't sold <laughs> so and that's how i yeah. protected my time because i valued my time and i didn't want to go out and i didn't want to do estimates i wanted my salespeople to do estimates and when they sell the job i'll go out there and make sure everything's done right yeah oh yeah 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 definitely yeah because i you know i I kind of, I, I made some notes of different types of business models that I've seen out there. And, um, you know, it, I started to really realize it, it, it depends a lot on what you're selling, who you're selling it to. Cause you know, you have, you have firms that do more commercial work. You have uh, firms that do um, like rentals or more low end type stuff. You have firms that do mostly carpet, some that do mostly vinyl planks. Now, I mean, there's some stores that only sell vinyl plank, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of just hitting the niche market and uh, every single one of those models would have a different, you know, it would be more advantageous to do it one way or the other. Cause I can tell you right now, you know, with, with the clients that we get the side evaluation, if, if it were not done very thorough, it would be a complete nightmare for our installers. Um, just because a lot of those little details is what our, our customers expect. And um, um you know, it's like the devil's in the details with a lot of our stuff versus, you know, if we were selling a lot more straightforward jobs, you know, the, um, it, it wouldn't be nearly as necessary for that. So, you know, um, I, I always tended to be a more, you know, high end uh, work uh, installer. So the, the, in, the salespeople would absolutely drive me nuts with, with what they would order, the trims that they would get, not, you know, explain to the customer that we, we need to do a certain amount of prep, you know, there are just so many things that I felt were just blatantly obvious. And I mean, we're talking not just one store. I mean, you know, I've slept for over, you know, probably 10 to 15 stores um, over the years uh, in two different States, you know, and, and, uh, but, you know, I talked to some of the other installers that, you know, got all the easy jobs or they just did carpet and, you know, it really wasn't that, that big of a deal to them, but uh, um, any of the installers that were really trying to raise the bar do the right amount of prep. Um, they always felt like they're getting the short end of the stick because it wasn't really evaluated properly. And it was just a fight to try to, you know, get any extra prep to do it right. Um, any of the custom stuff that, you know, needed to get done to make it right uh, was very rarely addressed. And so I, I think that that's where, you know, the installers could get sour um, you know, on that end, but, you know, on the other end, you know, on the sales side of it, you know, now that I have my retail store, I'm going, man, you know, it'd be really hard, you know, somebody sells, 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 but they're not great side evaluators. It'd be really easy to overlook it, especially if they could kind of smooth talk their way out of the problems. Sure. Okay. So that was a big point we were talking about too. Uh, last interview was uh, the installers and you know, everybody says the installer pay is one of the biggest uh, problems. And I've always said it's um, the things that installers want the most from what I've seen is they either want um, a plenty of work. That's one of it. And the other thing is they want to make sure all the stuff's on the job site. They want to be able to complete the job site. And by not doing any kind of site evaluation, I think that comes up a lot more. And I can tell you, we're guilty of this. Um, I mean, go and blow, get some sales. And when you've got a busy store and busy showroom, you try to do the things like um, put in good processes to overcome that. 
Um, certainly going to be a little bit more complicated with wood flooring, um, even luxury vinyl, though doing uh, floating floors, you're going to have to do some work around the baseboards, take those up. And there's always things that certainly a salesperson, I'm not even going to say that they miss, they probably just don't even really care. They're trying to get the sale. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and they do want to avoid complications. So rather than discuss it, a lot of salespeople were ignored or turned a blind eye towards it. And they, they may take it for granted. And I'm not going to say that they're taking the installers for granted. I don't think it's that personal, but yeah. they're yeah. literally just trying to sell the job and they want to sell the job and, and get paid as well. Um, so I think it's normal human nature that they're not going to say things that make this job more complicated. They know the installer will figure it out, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. which is wrong, but that, that's just yeah. the reality of the situation. And especially when you get a big company that has six, seven, eight more salespeople, you know, and they're yeah. doing multiple installs a day or a week. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I have worked for companies like that and um, I always did try to get the, get in really good with the salesperson that, um, kept me in mind more when they were selling. <laughs> that was for sure. I definitely wanted to be working on their projects, you know, cause, uh, you know, it's, it's like what you said, you just want a smooth, you know, efficient process. And, and ultimately too, um, you know, I was, uh, me and a lot of installers are concerned, you know, we want to see the customer happy when we're done. So if they commission us to do it a certain way and we know it's just, you know, yeah, we can get it passable, but you know, you just know that customer isn't going to be happy. You know, maybe those baseboards were just extremely beat up, right? And you know that they could do baseboards, but you know, they the you know, the salesperson either overlooked it or got a little lazy and you wanted to just lock in that sale rather than bring up the baseboard issue. You know, but when that installer gets there, you know, now now that you know that customer's gone, well you know, look at these baseboards and, you know, why didn't they offer me to get new ones or may, or, or, or isn't new baseboards part of the, the deal? You know, now that installer, that could have been addressed, you know, at the forefront, but now that installer is going, gosh, I just want to get my job done. You know, they're complaining about right. these baseboards. All of that could have been handled up front. And, you know, I think, you know, just that having that healthy relationship with the installer and the salesperson, you know, if they do have that, that foresight, because, you know, th this is something that is, uh, it, it's fairly common, you know, that, that, that happens uh, um, on the, on the job site for installers, especially like what you said for the bigger firms, um, maybe they have new salespeople, maybe they don't have good checklists, you know, so a lot of that could be with, I mean, I was almost, I was just thinking, gosh, you know, a lot of these things could be caught with a good checklist, but um, all the the flooring stores that I ever sub for, I mean, they they really weren't using the checklist. And really like could. That. I mean, those processes, systems. Uh, we talk about Floors App. Um, there, if you follow along their process, so if you're entering the order on good software system, it'll it'll include the things that are normally missed. You know, yeah. do you have baseboards? Do you have transitions? Is there a toilet that needs to be removed? Is there a dishwasher? You know, what are just this little checklist that you can go down and makes it easy for you to prepare the estimate and not miss anything. Yeah. Um, but we also created a program that includes the baseboards and transitions. Uh, the problem with that, it, it made it easy to sell, but you really needed that side evaluation too to make sure. Because here's the other thing that happens. I'm going to go in there I'm going to take my measurements. I'm going to try and close the sale. Person's busy. They got something else going on. They may not be able to do it. So they may get back to me. Now, when they get back to me and they're ready to go, I, I don't have a clue what I, <laughs> I need in the way of transitions or anything else like that. So I may not have all the information. And I do think there should be gold star customers. Um, and this is something I tried to implement for a long time and never really got that down quite right. So the gold star customer would be, you know, we need to identify that there are some customers that need more attention. There's something unique about their job. And 
we should have a site evaluation. At one time, we had this gentleman working for us, Adam, and we called it the Adam experience. So Adam would go out there and make sure that we had everything we need. You know, you got a customer that has a long driveway, very wealthy neighborhood. Don't be parking a truck on there that leaks oil, you know, <laughs> just yeah. things like that, that you need to identify. This one customer had upholstered walls and it's like, you just need a lot of extra uh, attention to this one client, you know, so there should be things identified about some clients and not because they're bitchy or, or anything, but they're obviously going to require some additional attention. It, I mean, you know, those, I think that that would be good if the salespeople really identify, you know, because it's like what you say, say the, where there's a problem, there's opportunity, you know, a lot of those, let, let's say you do have a high end project that, that, that salesperson identifies, this is over my head, but there's a ton of opportunity for upsells. So, you know, maybe they have those upholstered walls. Well, you know, maybe you're going to sell them on, um, um, you know, dust containment and, um, you know, protecting that with plastic or, you know, whatever you have to do to, to do all those things, you know, uh, factoring in, um, a lot of little extras that, you know, the side evaluator might be able to bring up a lot of extra, um, add-ons to the project that the customer just eats up you know they just love that get this premium service and and you know or it could be even as you know identifying pieces of furniture you know that may need to be moved professionally and you know if that's sold properly that person could walk away going wow you know they they told me hey that's an antique it's extremely valuable why don't we have a professional come move that pool table or, you know, whatever, the, the grand piano or whatever, you know, and if, if it's explained to them and it's really sold, uh, you know, in a, in a way that that the person sees them as a technical expert, um, they can walk away feel, feeling, you know, paying more, but also feeling well served. Are you aware of the independent agencies that do, uh, they, they'll do measuring for you? Um they'll help prepare. I've never used one. I've, I've gotten emails from them saying that we do uh, measuring and we, we prepare contracts or, you know, and that might just be on commercial jobs or I'm not really familiar with them, but I was thinking about the smaller companies that may not have the manpower or somebody that can do a professional site evaluation. What should they do? Yeah, I think that the service, I think, I think they do like a, uh, blue, off of blueprints you know you have large because they have software that will you know it's kind of like got an ai element to it and they you know can break it down for them but yeah wow. i think that that's probably i i would say the small firms it's only you know like we're a small firm and it it's really not hard for us to implement in the site evaluation because uh, being that i am hands-on with with uh, our installers um I can, you know, they're employees, they're not subs. So it's very much so my best interest to make sure that they hit the ground running, right? right. Because if they're there twirling their thumbs trying to figure out, you know, uh, how I've instructed them to do it. Um, and it's not, you know, um, I haven't really walked over and created a game plan for them. Um, I know that they're going to spend all that time just trying to figure that out. So you know, I'll make a video. And I'm basically, I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'm basically um, setting the project up so that they can hit the ground running on it. And that, that's just not something that you could do with a, a higher volume uh, company. Um, at least I, I don't think you could that easily. Um, um, you know, so, uh, but I, so I think on a small firm, it would almost be easier in that sense. Whereas I think the mid-sized firms is where they would really struggle with the side evaluation because they don't, you know, want, re they don't quite do enough uh, volume to hire a side evaluator. Um, they don't want redundant uh, visits to the home. Um, you know, especially if they're selling I would. products or not, you know, really high end, there's not as much risk there. You, you know, could find an old retired installer yeah. to go out and pay them piecework, you know, you might pay them. 
a hundred bucks per site evaluation or, you know, again, yeah. it's worth it if it's a sold job. Yeah. So if you don't oh. have one on staff, maybe you could find a, an older installer that's still working, but, you know, maybe you don't want them on their knees as much and, uh, yeah. or somebody that, that is retired that can do that side evaluation and make sure everybody has what they need. But then it shouldn't be that hard to build the processes and really teach salespeople what they need to know. And I, I'm as guilty as anybody about that, you know, and, and really, you know, I'm, I'm a grow the business, get it sold, let's move kind of guy. And um, so I try to create processes that make things simple um, and never really had that good understanding of some of the problems the installers go through. Yeah, yeah, I th that hits home to me. I, I probably err on the side of protecting the the installers, you know, for the growth of my business. You know, yeah. that's just, just because I really, you know, I I had a lot of struggles with, you know, me just trying to do a good quality job and feeling like I was held back by little things like that. And so I probably err on the other end of this. That's actually why I like talking to you, you know what I mean? Because you're, you know, you're coming more from the, uh, you know, uh, growing your business, marketing, you know, having an asset that you could sell, um, you know, and I'm kind of like the, the uh, if you come from the installer side or I'm kind of, you know, super concerned about not sacrificing quality. Um, my customer, I, I want a very high customer experience uh, satisfaction. And, uh, you know, and so I, I, I think it's somewhere in the middle of those two. I think we could, people could really hit the sweet spot. Rachel Berlin actually has mentioned that they have a, uh, uh, an installer, a veteran installer that um, I believe wanted to get off their knees and he does all of their site evaluations. Yeah, I, I've never cared for their model. She's one of the people that I visited first in Wisconsin. It was one of the best trips I ever had. And um, I, the salesperson sets it up. So the site evaluator or installer goes out there and gets all the details. Then they come back in the showroom and sell it. And I just think, in order to be a good salesperson, you gotta be, part of what we do when we're selling is decorating. Yeah. So how can you do that if you don't go in the home, you know, and you just yeah. get a feel for the space and the lighting and the, um, you know, the environment. I wanna be in the, in the home and they're very, very successful. I personally just didn't care for their, their system, their process. Cause again, I, and I probably made the suggestion to her the same way I am you is saying that I think the site evaluation is fantastic, but it should be done after the job is sold. Yeah. In my opinion. And you're, cause it is going to be difficult to scale when you're the one that always has to do that site evaluation. Have, what have you done maybe to teach some of your salespeople what they need to look for. So maybe there's times you're not available, like you, you go on vacation or you get COVID or you know, do customers yeah. just wait until you are available or is there anybody that can take your place? I can have, um, I can have, well, so I, I could probably go, I can have the salespeople kind of um, take over the reins on that um, and then have one of the installers actually do the site evaluation. So, I mean, that is one thing that uh, I do want to figure out. I do want the business to be able to run without me, you know, as passionate as I am about it, I really do want to have an asset where I can walk away from it for a period of time and, and it is fine. Um, it's, you know, truly an asset, not just a job. So, um, I have, uh, um, I would probably lean towards what you're saying, allow the salesperson, have them knowledgeable enough to not sell the job improperly, uh, but also have an installer, maybe a veteran or something like that, be able to come do the site evaluations. And, and you know, probably more so like if it's a very straightforward job and the, the salesperson has a good checklist 
and they're knowledgeable, they should honestly be able to sell those ones and then maybe teach them when it is appropriate that we, even, even if it's one of the installers that will be on the job, uh, go take a look at it. Just make sure everything's great so that we don't show up and go, oh no, uh, we got an issue here. <laughs> kind of thing you know oh, that's the other part that we have to do if we're not doing the site evaluation we have to train the installers on how to communicate the problems with us because sometimes yeah. they'll communicate it with the customer and yeah. say this is going to cost more take care of it maybe they don't even say it's going to cost more they just take care of it and now we're stuck with a bigger bill from the installer and not having the ability to go back to the customer and say hey this yeah. costs more yeah. So I basically kind of tell, told you, you know, uh, part of, you know, where I feel like it holds us back. And obviously your model is is more scalable, but I, I don't deal with that. I mean, it, it honestly, from an installer's point of view, our guys don't ever have to do that. They don't, things are literally not meant. I mean, they're never missed. So we never have that, that has to be addressed. We never have to come back to the customer and ask for more money. None of the installers ever have to have uh, in our company ever have to have those conversations. So we, it, the, I've never had the wrong transitions. We've never been short on material. Um, like I said, we literally never have a lot of those things that used to drive me nuts. But on the other hand, I've also built a system that is not that scalable. So I'm trying to figure out, and I hope this helps others to try to figure out, well, what's that sweet spot? You know, where, right. where you, you know, basically give the best quality, for the customer experience, but still have something that can grow and be an asset. And, and I do think there's a sweet spot for people in, in that um, when you sell the job, you can have that, even paying your installer a little extra to stop by the house and do a side eval. Yeah. You know, having that those checklists, there are solutions to that problem where people can, you know, it's not going to cost them a lot more. They don't have to miss a beat. And they may be able to charge a little bit more yeah. and talk about that side evaluation with the customer and what are the, you know, I would sell the site evaluation too, like that checklist. What is it that we do um, to prevent you from having these problems and give you your full warranty? And those are the kind of things that give them confidence in you and make them afraid to not use you. Yeah. Hey, um, I have a quick question for you. So I, this, this kind of is a little intriguing. We had, you know, the, the big box stores, it always intrigues me what they come up with because, you know, they're at this corporate level and um, lo the Lowe's model interests me. And uh, I've talked to other installers and basically the, they, they pay the installer to go uh, measure and do a site evaluation uh, before they sell the job. And, um, well, they it, charge the customer 50 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for the measure. Yeah. And then they, I guess they pay the installer to do that. Right. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I did. I kind of thought I was, I don't know. I, I mean, I, look, if it's a, it, it's a volume play for them. So they, they've got enough people coming in the door that they could sell that measure. The, yeah. They don't do the free and home estimates. Their salespeople don't earn commission. Yeah. Um, so practically speaking, it's a model that probably wouldn't work out for most people. And I, some people who charge for the estimate um, tend to be smaller, more specialized. But if you're trying to do any kind of volume or grow your business, you're probably given a free and home estimate. Yeah. Yeah. But so, do you think that since Lowe's has such high walk-in volume, um, okay. that it works for them? Well, yeah. It's a, uh, for instance, people will say they, they complain about the free installations, you know, yeah. and I said, nobody's going to them because of free installation. They're in the store and they're in the market for flooring. It's convenient. And yeah. Lowe's is familiar. It's trusted even though it shouldn't be, <laughs> it is. Yeah. So we can criticize them all we want and say, you don't like them and they don't have a good reputation. They don't pay installers. Well, you can, we can criticize them all we want, but you got to yeah. realize that customers 
like and trust them because they're in their store, they're in their environment. So, you know, you might not get a chance at doing business with them. So, you know, they've come up with a pretty good model for selling. Their margins are nothing though. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It, you know, it really has muddied the waters. I wish, I wish Home Depots and Lowe's would stick to do it yourself. And uh, the reality is, whenever they're providing their service, they're not good at it because they are a do-it-yourself store. Yeah. I always marvel at how many times you go in the bathroom at Home Depot and Lowe's and there's something broken. Why? Because nobody knows how to do anything there. (laughs) It's a do-it-yourself store. (laughs) So (laughs) there's always broken stuff in the bathroom. (laughs) I have a general contractor right now that uh, bought from a box store and uh, they told him that there was no problem putting a uh, floating vinyl plank over an engineered wood floor glued to concrete. And yeah. it, it basically, it ruined both floors. <laughs> they called oh, me. Wow. A, yeah. Cause the, the GC wasn't using us at the time. And they, uh, we, they started using us and he goes, Hey, we did this for two years ago. There's something wrong with it. And I get there all the seams are busting because it's not, the floor underneath is buckling and the floor, uh, the vinyl plank floor actually got so much moisture in it, it, it it's expanding and the inner floor underneath is molding. <laughs> and he goes, well, they told me, they showed me in the instructions that you can lay over existing hardwood flooring and we didn't have to take it up. <laughs> and I'm like, well, now you get to take up both floors. Yeah, and I, that whole concept of uh, laying over an existing floor I always explain to people, it's a great idea that doesn't work. Yeah. And I'm not even that knowledgeable about it. I I just know when it comes to baseboards, transitions, trying to take out the dishwasher, you know, and explain that it's not our job to save our customers money. Yeah. It's a great idea. I wish it worked, but it doesn't work. It's not a good idea. Yeah. 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 I was thinking that, like, I was, I was thinking, I was like, gosh, that, that must be nice for Home Depot to just be able to tell uh, customers really anything that it takes to sell the job, knowing that they're going to install it themselves and they'll, they'll never come back at them. <laughs> I mean, you, yeah. what are you going to do? Oh, you know, this person that worked for you guys two years ago told me some bad advice. I mean, it's like, wow, no wonder they can sell for such well, a And this is the other thing. I, I think a lot of times they absorb those problems. So it's not that they don't take care of any customers. They may just refund their money and be done with them. But, you know, they're, they're big enough and fast enough to absorb some of these problems. Some of the material they get, they get it so cheap that they're selling the same stuff I'm selling for uh, below my cost. Yeah, They're selling it as an installed product below my material costs. <laughs> yeah. I've run across that. And it's like, well, it's not made the same way. Try telling that to a customer. Same yeah. exact brand, looks exactly the same. <laughs> it's not made the same way. Right. Good luck with that story. Or, or two, you, um, you know, we've had to explain to the clients, you know, repeat clients that our, our, our costs have gone up for our, our flooring. And, you know, we're charging more to, you know, for that. And, um, and they'll go, oh, well, flooring's still the same price at Lowe's and Home Depot. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. well, you can, yeah. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> we're, we're, you, yeah. you, know, you know, basically. And it, I mean, it hasn't really hurt us, but it is, it is frustrating because you're going, gosh, you know, like collectively everybody in our, I know this is a little, little bit of a tangent, but, you know, I've seen the stock that Lowe's and Home Depot have, you know, and I look at the warehouses of the flooring stores around our town. I know that we do a lot more volume collectively as small dealers than the Lowe's and Home Depot do. But, you know, being that they consolidate their buying power, it's like they, you know, they can really, you know, use that play, but I'm just going, I don't know. I wish that there's some way that, because I know the independent dealers sell a lot more than the box stores do. Yeah. I'd like to see things change where it's, you know, I was, I was thinking of starting a group called let's play fair. And I think there's one that's already out there called let's play Flair, And to tell the 
suppliers that, you know, selling at such dramatically lower prices that yeah. they can sell it below our costs to the, the public. That's, that's not right. And yeah, you know, so I would like to see them, let's just play fair. I understand the volume. I, I understand they can buy it cheaper, but, yeah. but quite frankly, I'd be better off buying from them than buying from Mohawk or Shaw. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and that's probably what they should go to where Home Depot and Lowe's is like, okay, we'll sell to you guys too. <laughs> and well, they, yeah. they can get even better prices and then they can sell to us and we can, we can mark it up even more and, and sell it for more money. But because uh, we'd be buying it cheaper from Home Depot and Lowe's. <laughs> yeah, no, huh? well, you know, I, I think it's just one of those things, you know, they're using their market advantage to get lower prices. It would be awesome if independent dealers could use their collective buying power to do the same thing you know it's just it, that's business you know if there were i mean the, the independent dealers are doing some serious volume collectively it's yeah. just one voice in a big c but if there was some way to consolidate that power um we would get the upper hand on the negotiation you know, you know i give credit to the buying groups and Broadloom. there there are people that are uh, leveling the playing field, making it a lot more fair. And, you yeah. know, uh, that I've even broached the subject a couple of times. Do you really want government regulation? I mean, you know, I hate to even suggest that, but, you know, should there be some kind of fairness to this and the way we're treated? But I don't know. We, you know, focusing on that is, the wrong approach and mentality because the fact is they've always been cheaper and we've always done a great volume of business and everybody's growing. So and yeah, certainly for somebody like you, it's just the skill is beyond anything they can offer. So, you know, yeah. they're, they're not competition for you any day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. They're really not. It's, it's more just like, kind of like the frustration of it all, you know, cause I, I, I caught myself getting frustrated and I'm going, we don't even, our, our, our lowest in hardwood is their highest in hardwood. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we're really not even competing on the same product. So like, I really need to just like let it go. Just focus on my own business. <laughs> so I'm going to close this out, Matt. We got, um, um, it's a good interview. I was really interested in that discussion because I've talked about it again with Rachel Berlin and, uh, talked around the horn uh, with other people about this topic of uh, having a site inspector. When should you have the site inspection done? Um, and, and just that whole sales process and how do we improve the sales yeah. process as well as the customer experience and the installer experience. So, and one last little thing I'll, I'll leave you with is, is that argument of the conversation. A lot of people, um, want to say who comes first you know does does your customer come first and some people have argued well no my employees come first uh or even my family comes first and i always thought it was such a ridiculous argument because to me whoever has the need is the one that comes first <laughs> so it's you're not putting a priority based on uh what relationship you value the most you know we want to take great care of uh customers take great care of our employees and meanwhile, enjoy our family lives. So it's not really a who comes first mentality. I mean, you want everybody to be happy if you can. So adding these processes and systems just benefits everybody. You know? Yeah. I more with that. Yeah. I, I like, I like these conversations because it really does get the wheels turning of, you know, how can we do it better? You know, how can the people, our customers benefit and our employees and the store owner? You know, there's there's definitely solutions if you get creative and uh, think outside the box and, and really learn. Yeah, absolutely. All right, brother, I'm going to close this out. Thanks for uh, joining me again. That was a good conversation. Great. All right, gang, thanks for joining the Flooring Business Podcast. And if you'd like to have a discovery call for your flooring business where we can review where you're at and how you can increase sales and profits by over 30%, just contact me at jerry at profitnowwithjerry.com for more information. We'll schedule that call and you guys have a great profitable week.